Welcome everyone and good afternoon. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. My name is Allison Jones. I'm Director of Program Strategy and Management here at the Alliance for Health Policy. We are a nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to helping policymakers and the public better understand health policy, the root of the nation's healthcare issues, and the trade offs posed by various proposals for change. We are so thrilled today to be presenting our webinar, What's Coming in 2024 Health Policy Forecast for the New Year. The Alliance has served as a trusted educational resource for the health policy community for over 30 years, and today's discussion will explore anticipated state and federal policy priorities for the coming year. We're excited to showcase the different viewpoints and perspectives of our fantastic panelists that we have here as we look ahead to what to expect during this upcoming election year. Before we get started, I just want to take a moment to thank our generous sponsor. Today's webinar is generously supported by the National Institute for Healthcare Management. We are grateful for your support for this program and for all you do to improve healthcare by advancing diverse perspectives on health. I also want to take a moment to share a few quick logistical notes. We invite you to follow the Alliance for Health Policy on LinkedIn to stay informed about upcoming events like this one. You can also find us on Facebook and YouTube. Today's panel has a Q&A section at the end, and we encourage you all to be active participants. So please share your questions at any time, and we will add those to the list for a discussion at the end. You should see a dashboard on the right side of your web browser that has a speech bubble icon with a question mark. You can use that speech bubble to submit questions that you have for the panelists at any time, and we'll collect them and address them during the Q&A. Throughout the webinar, you can also chat us any technical issues you may be experiencing, and our team is here to assist you. If we don't get to your question, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at info at allhealthpolicy.org, and we'll do our best to connect you to additional information. With that, I am so pleased to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Julie Robner. Julie is the Chief Washington Correspondent at KFF Health News and host of its weekly health policy news podcast, What the Health. She joined KFF Health News after 16 years as a health policy correspondent for NPR, where she led the network's coverage of the passage and implementation of the Affordable Care Act. A noted expert on health policy issues, Julie is the author of the critically praised reference book, Healthcare Politics and Policy A to Z, now in its third edition. You can read more about Julie's background and the bios of our other fantastic panelists on the Alliance website. And now I'll turn it over to you, Julie. Thank you. Allison, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here. We have a ton to talk about and only an hour to do it. So let me introduce our speakers very quickly. As Allison mentioned, you have their full bios and then we will get to it. Uh, first, we have Sarah Keel Eggy. She's founding partner and principal at Split Oak Strategies. Sarah has been a longtime Senate staffer, including 11 years at the Senate Budget Committee. Next is Nicholas Ulecki. He's a principal at the Todd Strategy Group and a former staffer for the House Ways and Means Subcommittee on Health. Nick also worked at HHS in the Trump administration. Finally, we have Hemi Tourson, President and Executive Director of the National Academy for State Health Policy. Before joining Nashby, Hemi worked, sorry, before joining Nashby, Hemi worked at the GAO and the National Governors Association. So we have a, an eminently qualified panel to uh, give us a guide to what we think might happen this year. I wanna start with a couple of questions for each of you to answer. The first one is a two-parter. What was the most significant thing that happened in 2023 for health policy? And what was the most significant thing that didn't happen that you expected to happen? Sarah, why don't you start? Sure, thanks, Julie. Great to be here today. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, I think the most significant thing from my perspective that happened this year was how much bipartisan, or this last year, I should say, has how much bipartisan legislating there was on the topic of healthcare. Um, we had two, you know, pieces of legislation advance in December out of the House with very broad bipartisan support, the lower cost, more transparency legislation, which covered a range of topics from uh, transparency issues to PBM reforms to public health investments. Um, and then the, the Support Act reauthorization legislation, which also advanced with huge bipartisan support. By the same token, over in the Senate, um, I mean, I can't remember the last time we had a year with two healthcare markups at the Finance Committee, and they advanced not only legislation on PBMs and prescri prescription drug pricing reforms, um, but a robust extenders package um, that, that is you know, part of the conversation ongoing on what to do on extenders. And same with the health committee. They passed a bunch of legislation on prescription drug pricing um, reforms, PBM reforms, and primary care health investments. 
Um, in terms of things that most surprised me, I think the thing that most surprised me this year is what the committees, particularly in the House, didn't do. I was expecting a really robust oversight effort by Republicans looking at a range of administrative actions. And really, there wasn't as much as I expected. A little bit on COVID-19 oversight, um, you know, certainly some robust conversations around accelerated approval and the NCD on Alzheimer's um, drugs coming out of CMS, but didn't get as much into oversight of the IRA implementation as I expected this year. So, Nick, what was uh, what was the most significant thing that you saw happen and what should have happened but didn't? Yeah, no, I, I think I can be, you know, pretty, uh, pretty quick. Just I completely agree with Sarah. You know, it's I think I was a little bit surprised at a lot of the work on transparency and that all three committees uh, or five committees, however you want to look at it, took a look at our healthcare system and realized that kind of we're finally moving away from the token keyword middleman and actually kind of pull it, pulling up the you know the, the cloak on on all of it and hopefully continue to move forward on these concepts of you know understanding that while competition requires some level of negotiation that happens between private entities there has to be a level of transparency if we're going to look at this healthcare system uh that's you know uh such a significant portion of our GDP, uh, while at the same time so foreign to the average American uh, as they look at their healthcare costs rising, uh, not understanding that you know there are ways for us as a system to lower them. So people, you know, to have all those chairmen kind of take a look at that um, was great, you know, and 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 seeing the attention to rural health was another really kind of strong aspect in the last year. Uh, chairman Harrington at budget. Uh, Chairman Smith, uh, both have uh, RFPs and R, you know RFIs out on how can we improve rural health care. Uh, that's you know that's the real kind of uh, that was probably what was most exciting to me uh, in, in what happened. You know, and what didn't happen. Um, I agree that there there are some things that we expected just to be assigned. I think that there you know when we extend things like CHCs and you know. Short-term short-term extensions on a CR of programs that require, um, I guess, uh, a level of uh, view in the future. Um, you know, the assignment of grants, things like that. You know, we're we're kind of just lagging when we do that, right? Lagging behind the system and act and actually expanding the programs or expanding access to programs. But really, my surprise is that we haven't done much on the side uh, of of mental health. Um, I had expected that there would be more work done in, the, in that year on support. Um, the, the suicide rates in our country are appalling. Um, and you know, if, even if you just look at our numbers here in DC, um, there it's, it's, it's almost every day. And, and so with the, you know, the, the, the most surprising thing to me was, was that the post COVID we want to, we want to put it behind us, that kind of attitude that, that that belief almost pervaded and you know almost got into the fact that we also didn't want to talk about how covid caused you know a very major mental health crisis in america and so that's kind of lagged behind my hope again is we can talk about this later on the on the webinar but that we, we move forward on things that that address those issues but that's kind of that's that's my response Amy, while we were here in Washington watching Congress kind of spin its wheels, what were the states doing? And what did you think the states would do that they didn't? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. And so happy to be here representing the state perspective with our work with state leaders across um, executive and legislative branches. So um, I would, I just want to say two things. Um, one was states were very active this past year, um, incredibly busy, um, passing a lot of legislation, taking a lot of executive action in, in a number of different areas. I was actually surprised by the, the level of activity that we saw. Um, the most significant event for states was Medicaid Unwind. And we can talk more about this later, Julie, but you know, just thinking about, we have almost 29 million people that have been redetermined for coverage and another 15, over 15 million who were disenrolled. Massive, um, you know, redetermined eligibility event um, after we had our lowest levels of, of uninsured rates because of the continuous Medicaid eligibility coming from the pandemic. So we can talk about that in greater detail. So that I think was the most significant event for states to handle this past year. And they're, they're still in the midst of it, frankly, a number of 
them. Um, but one thing I just wanted to raise was the, I, the focus on health-related social needs, formerly known as social determinants of health. This has been a topic that I've been working on for many years now with states. And I really feel like it was um, all of the challenges, housing, food insecurity, um, has really been exacerbated by the pandemic. And that's also true on behavioral health, healthcare workforce, all these other topics that we can talk about later. But I just want to focus on this topic for a moment. Um, you know, states have been looking for more flexibility to think about how Medicaid can pay for those services that are not traditional um, healthcare services. In, in light of the whole person and how their, their health is related to all these different pieces. With CMS putting out um, their framework and starting to do more approvals of allowing Medicaid to pay for things like short-term rental assistance and short-term food prescriptions as a bridge to longer-term housing and food resources, I think has really started a, a trend that had already begun before this past year, but we're looking at eight states that received approval now for the um, waivers that's going to allow Medicaid to do things it didn't before. And we have another, you know, at least eight states in the queue. So that is something I think is very significant in terms of policy change and thinking differently about the Medicaid program. All right. Well, oh, we've lost Nick, but he is back. Um, there were a lot of things that Congress, as I mentioned, was supposed to do in 2023 that didn't get done, starting with all of the appropriations bills. So what, and I think Sarah and Nick, you already referred to some of them, but go back into what are some of the authorizations that expired and what will it mean if they don't get done? You might want to explain what the Support Act is for the probably 10 or 15 people here who don't know. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm happy to kick things off and then Nick, please feel free to jump in. Um, you know, I think the important thing to note is a lot of the programs that expire, particularly HRSA programs, the Community Health Center Fund, Teaching Health Center GME, National Service Corps, a number of the Medicare and Medicaid provisions that expire are actually currently not expired because they were extended as part of the recent CR and will continue to March 8th. But there are definitely a number of provisions, particularly in the, the PAPA, the Pandemic All Preparedness Legislation, and in the Support Act, which is a piece of legislation meant to help communities address substance use disorder in this country um, that expired at the beginning of the year. Um, I think the positive thing is that a lot of the provisions that expired were authorizations of appropriations. And so long as those programs continue in the CR or should we get to an omnibus, an omnibus appropriations bill, um, those programs will continue, but I think the really important point is PAPA and support have not been reauthorized for five years. Um, you think about how much has transpired, not only in the uptick in the opioid epidemic, um, obviously we've had a major pandemic occur since the last time we reauthorized PAPA. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of policies that, that need updating. Um, and depending on what your views are of the current administration, to the extent these programs aren't authorized and we end up funding them in a CR and not in an omnibus that comes with a comprehensive conference report along with it, it delegates a lot of authority to the agencies to decide how to spend those dollars. Um, and then there are important policies that, that are bipartisan that both chambers have been working on, such as scheduling of xylazine that simply won't get done unless those bills um, are, are, you know, included as a reauthorization, perhaps as part of a March 8th package. Nick, want to add something? You know, uh, Sarah is such a professional. She kind of, she kind of hit all of it. And, you know, I, I, I think the, those are all things. The only, again, just want to touch on the concern that, you know, while I agree that there are a lot of programs that can be kind of punted month to month, uh, but there are definitely programs that we're we're definitely struggling <clears throat> to keep afloat uh, in some of those grant programs where you you, you really can't be a, a grantee for four months, right? Uh, and so we, you know, it, it ends up being, you know, it, it's sort of one of those weird rock in a hard place situations where, yes, you want to signal that you support these programs, so you include them in the CR but how much of that money actually goes to advancing the program as opposed to probably just advancing, you know, the, the folks that are receiving a salary from, from the grant and having them continue their work, which may or may not was supposed to discontinue uh, at that time if the grant was supposed to go somewhere else, which, you know, is the frustration I'm hearing, particularly uh, from HHS and, and from folks that work in, in, those, in, in those agencies. Um, but that's, 
that's all that's all I really have to add uh, there is is uh, the appropriations bills you know that the speaker's committed to getting it done um, you know we'll 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 have to see the next how the next month looks the speaker's been committing to getting getting the uh, appropriations done since last year um, and but the previous speaker also committed to getting the appropriations done. Um, let's let's finally turn to 2024. Um, Amy, what are two or three things that you're looking to uh, to be popping in the states on health policy this year? Yeah, um, I appreciate Nick's comment on behavioral health because that has been front and center um, for state policymakers. Really thinking about, um, just to mention a little bit for 2023, there were like billion dollar packages put together in more than one state um, during their state legislative process of investing in mental health as well as substance use disorder services. We have opioid settlement dollars that are flowing to the states and counties that need to be invested in. So I re we really are taking a look at and we'll continue to be working with states on what they're going to be doing in behavioral health specifically in 2024. With respect to just a couple different areas I'll mention, behavioral health workforce, um, we have shortages. The children's mental health crisis in particular has been very challenging for states. You see crisis stabilization units popping up across states because um, kids don't have anywhere to go and they are being in, treated in the ED, which is not the appropriate place of, or setting of care. So there's a lot of thought about what to do about that. Integration of behavioral health and primary care. I really do think there's a change and how we think about mental health services, the stigma that has been sort of long associated with how we um, talk about mental health services, to me, has really um, ratcheted way down in the conversations that are happening at the state level and how people are thinking about trying to get broader access to services. So I'm hopeful on the integration side, we're going to get some real progress in 2024 on the integration piece. And you have things like CCBHCs, um, which are um, continuing to expand across states as, as another area. Um, the second um, topic I would just say is healthcare workforce. So that, you know, coming out of the pandemic, yes, we have sort of um, needs for nursing and primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, but there's also um, some real thinking around um, paraprofessionals and thinking about how we better um, connect with community and get people to services. And so there's a lot of interest in we, we're seeing across states um, more Medicaid coverage of, of um, professions such as doulas, midwives, community health workers, the long-term care um, aides, and really thinking about how do we help professionalize those groups and, and really get them on a track to attract people into the positions as well as keep them there. So I we're gonna spend a lot of time, I think, with states on that, and you'll see a lot of legislative packages that address those and make investments. Great. Nick, what are you looking for this year? Um, <clears throat> I think not to harp uh, uh, on the behavioral health situation. It, you know, my hope, and I think everyone's hope right now, um, is that we hopefully avoid just kind of talking about the cool things that are that are popping up on your Google searches. Um, you know, AI is great. We're still probably a few years out for full integration into the healthcare, the way that we talk about it. Um, you know, like I think there's the tinfoil hats are back. You know, and people need to understand that Skynet is not a real thing. Uh, if, if the computers were going to take us down, they would have done it 10 years ago. Because they, you know, we we've been living in this world, and that's important. But you know, the telehealth extensions are going to be really important um, this year. And again, I I understand that it's very expensive, and that's going to be a challenge as as Congress figures out how to do it. You know, but it's on the behavioral health side that's going to be important. You saw the numbers uh, of folks that sought uh, behavioral health and mental health services when telehealth was available, and those increased. As you know, you know, uh, older white males have been very reticent to speak, speaking to Hemi's uh, stigma, uh, right? Uh, people have been very reticent to do so, and those numbers actually jumped, particularly during COVID. And what I really, you know, I, I hate to look at silver linings from the, from a tragedy that was COVID, you know. But one thing is, is that we had a loneliness epidemic in our senior population already. We had a mental health problem in our VA and senior population that has been going on for years and largely ignored. And now it's the general population, and that's something that you know. I hope that between the committees of, of authorization and jurisdiction, we'll 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 take a look at it. You know, otherwise, um, you know, hopefully we're going to have a, a longer term. Uh, continuing resolution, uh, at least to get us, uh, and that, that carries healthcare policies to get us to 
lame duck or at least past September. Um, you know, I'd hate for us to have this conversation on a consistent basis. You know, I'm I'm excited to to see, you know, the a 40 to 3, you know, tax package come out of Ways and Means and see if there's an opportunity there, um, particularly when it comes to advancing the conversation of families and children and, and the child tax credit. Um, and seeing kind of how that all turns out. It's it's definitely a, a 90 degree turn from I think where a lot of people were like two years ago or a year ago when all that uh, BBB stuff was going on, um, but excited to see that that's there. Um, and that's that's kind of where, you know, I, the things that I really kind of look to 2024 and hope for, hopefully there's more healthcare markups, particularly on the house side, um, more discussion on innovation. The, you know, I think where the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Service or CMS is, on the advancement of innovative diagnostics, innovative uh, you know, pharmaceuticals. I think we're in this really weird place where the FDA has started to evolve. Uh, you know, you got AI, you got apps, you got these things that the FDA is willing to take a look at, assign people the jobs, and then go and really go after it. And we're not we're not seeing it, and it's a benefit. We don't get wonky, but like benefit category and all this, you know, like stuff about what CMS is and is, isn't allowed to cover. But my hope is that we start to address some of these things because there are crazy innovative diagnostics out there now. Uh, just to use one example, uh, that can probably help us lower costs in the future, you know. But as usual, we're a little bit held captive by our actuaries, whether it's at HHS by the the, the actuarial office or in Congress by CBO. And so, you know, how do we get over this hump? We all we all have uh, supercomputers in our pockets every single day, you know, and we live in a world where we don't we don't do enough. And, it, you know, why are why are there still people dying of, you know, diabetic, you know, diabetic reasons, you know, in their homes alone uh, when we have all the technology in the world that can identify situations like that and, and, and emerging, you know, different ones. But anyways, uh, sorry to, to blab on, but uh, let me turn it over to Sarah. <laughs> Sarah, what do you see coming down the pike? Um, well, the two things I'm paying a lot of attention to, I mean, I'm going to be frank. The first is what is going to happen with this package on March 8th? Um, you know, there is a robust set of policies potentially on the table for consideration. And I think there are some differences of opinion about whether we should go narrow and more short term. Uh, a streamlined package with, you know, taking a lot of the offsets that have been under discussion off the table uh, versus a more robust package, uh, you know, two years worth of extenders that that potentially brings in some of the behavioral health investments, potentially brings in some of the transparency, PBM and pharmacy reforms. Um, it, and so I think how that plays out is going to tell us a lot about how much is being kicked down the, kicked down the road uh, to the lame duck. Um, and I think they even tell us about how difficult it may be to advance policies during the lame duck. Um, the other issue that I'm paying a lot of attention to, which definitely has crossover with, you know, what Hamie and Nick said on behavioral health workforce, primary care workforce investments, um, and telehealth, um, is what, if anything, is Congress going to do this year on physician payment reform? Um, there is definitely a growing consensus that a system that does not provide for inflationary updates for physicians is starting to break down. Um, you know, MedPAC just endorsed a set of recommendations that would provide for a partial MEI update uh, for 2025, um, as well as some additional incentives, um, bonus incentives uh, to care for patients um, who are lower income. Um, there is a lot of concern that, you know, budget neutrality is really tying CMS's hands anytime they want to do something to update the payment system that you know advantages one group of physicians, everybody gets a cut as a result, and that does not lead to sort of healthy outcomes overall. And Congress has to come along and help provide potentially uh, conversion factor relief as a result, which is under discussion for this March 8th package. So I think that is something I'm going to be paying a lot of attention to. I mean, you talk about physicians getting fed up, burnout selling their practices to health systems and health plans. You know, it's tied in with the consolidation conversation that's that's ongoing. Um, but, you know, making changes costs money. 
And how are we going to pay for that? And there are not a lot of offsets sitting around on the shelf at CBO. Well, actually, they do have a lot of offsets sitting around on shelves. It's just that they're not politically viable offsets. Um, that'll be a big question for me. And I think it's just an interesting year, too, with so many you know, well-respected members of the, the DOC caucus retiring at the end of this Congress and, you know, what might that mean um, for for the end of this year and beyond? Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of expertise that's going to walk out the door at the end of 2024. Well, 2024 is not just an election year, but a presidential election year. So um, how will that affect what might or might not get done? Are there things that are more or less likely to happen because it's an election year? Hamie, I know that obviously this is not directly applicable to the states, but it's going to be an election year for a lot of state legislators too, and a lot of governors. Um, is it, do do think do more things happen in even numbered years, or is it kind of like Washington, where everybody freezes in place? No, I think I appreciate the question. So no, states do not freeze. They have to balance their budgets, um, and the work must continue. But um, there are some dynamics, I think, because this is a presidential election year. A couple things, and um, we have eleven governors up. Um, and eight of those are going to flip. So in those states, you will have new leadership. And you know, I've worked with sort of states for a long time. Whenever you have a new governor, even if the same party, things change, um, different priorities, different approaches. And so there will be um, sort of work to do on that front. Um, it's what's another piece that's it's a little bit of a shorter legislative year for a number of states. Um, their sessions are shorter for different reasons. And there's a couple of states where they're not, they don't have um, uh, their legislative um, year this year, they're skipping this year. There's four states of the, on that front. So I do think it might, it will be a busy legislative year, but 2025, I think there'll be even more things happening. One of the things that um, states are very attuned to is when there is an administration potential change or election, um, what can we get from CMS before they start not approving things? And, you know, what are they going to be pushing out? So, you know, especially for states that have um, waivers pending, I think there's concern about how many of these are actually going to be able to get done. We know CMS is short staffed and they're not able to process everything as quickly as they like. They have Medicaid Unwind also going on and other priorities. And so, you know, what are the things that states are really going to want to ask for and be able to receive with respect to federal approval, I think, is a question for a number of them. The other thing I will also say is it's a very active year for the Innovation Center. They have rolled out a number of different models targeted at states. We are working with states um, across all of these models. We've yet to see the NOFOs for two of them. Um, so I think another question is, wow, you know, are we going to apply for that? Are we already in one model? Are we going to be allowed to apply for that? And that's across, you know, behavioral health, maternal health, the head model, and making care primary. So, so all of those um, activities are, I think, creating a lot of action at the state level, thinking about, do we have the bandwidth to, to move forward on this? And how quickly is the federal government going to move? So Sarah and Nick, uh, you know, that it used to be that a presidential election year, all bets were off, nothing happened. I don't think that's really true anymore. Um, I think that <laughs> things don't happen sometimes as we've seen in odd numbered years. Uh, well, what do you expect the fact that it's an election year and you know presidential election year that would give something a push or that would push something down on the agenda? What I guess I'm asking whether what are the items that are most politically sensitive? Yeah, you you know, I'll, I'll, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in, um, you know, and one, <clears throat> kudos to, to both uh, of my fellow panelists for bringing up the doc, the doc payment issues. Obviously, we're at a, we're, we're back at the cliff. We're back at a new SGR uh, with the macro stuff coming down. So, you know, like that's, that's something that really needs to be talked about. And as well as the, the discussion over CMMI, Liz Fowler and her team, have really ramped up working with the states and, and getting everything done there and just done a terrific job of going from the, the ground up. And, and so some of those answers that you've asked for are definitely important. And as to the election year, you know, we live in a, <clears throat> we, were, we were just at a, at an event where, you know, the word unprecedented has sort of now become a word that I really hate hearing. Um, you know, it's, it's waking up is unprecedented at this point. So, you know, where, where we look at 2024 as a presidential, where you could probably say that in every presidential year, starting in June, uh, you sort of shut down the policy world, uh, and and it's only the presidential platform. Uh, in this election, I think the platform of who are the two likely candidates 
uh, for, for each party have been very well established. Um, and I don't know that Congress in a world now where the House is passing most legislation under suspension of the rules um, is looking to say, oh, well, we can or can't get anything done. You know, Sarah pointed out everything hinges on what happens on March 1 and 8. Um, because are we doing this again in June? Right. You know, and like that means something has to be done. Uh, and so I, I while I believe that, you know, the same issues that Carl Rove spoke about in 2004, you know, are still front and center. You know, if everyone still just talks about the economy, they should be safe. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that some of the Supreme Court decisions that are set to drop this year, uh, and especially monumental ones that dropped in the last two years, um, are going to be of topic. And if people can you know, stick to states' rights or states' rights and, and go back to it, I think that's probably going to be the safest play that you're going to start seeing. But, you know, everyone gets baited in an election year. And so we'll see. I mean, the issue of reproductive health is always one that's going to be a lightning rod, and the issue of guns is going to be a lightning rod. And both issues are, for one side or the other, a problem for them with their base. And so, you know, that's, you know, I, I, I it's, un, it's going to be unprecedented in a presidential year, I hate that word, um, almost as much as synergy and vertical integration. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's, uh, but I think that's, that's what I, that's what I predict is you, we, the world has largely become desensitized to presidential, presidential elections. And so Congress will move forward in a different manner uh, and not be as involved in the national platform as they would have been eight, 10, or eight, 12, 16 years ago. Sarah? Anything that, that's going to jump out or recede into the background because it's presidential election year? So I think, you know, the committees have been working, you know, as we've already discussed, in a really bipartisan way on a range of issues. And I think that's going to continue this year, particularly on physician payment reform, telehealth. There's a bunch of other extenders that have to get done, like extending the, you know, acute hospital at home program, things like that. Um, that work will continue apace. But none of it is going to make it across the finish line to the president's desk until after this election is over. And then I think all bets are off. It depends on the election outcome and who wins the White House. And, you know, has anybody taken back or retained the House or the Senate? Um, how that all plays out. Um, but I think where there's going to be just a tremendous amount of ongoing action is in the administration. I mean, they are really doubling down. We've seen in recent weeks on protecting women's health care and women's ac access to contraception. Um, we're going to see, you know, more on behavioral health. Um, you know, HRSA in, in CMMI certainly made their announcement on maternal health or are making it this week on sort of new, new investments that they're making. Um, health equity continues to be front and center for this administration. Um, you know, more to come on AI in the coming weeks um, as a result of the administration's executive order on AI from last year, and I think more to come on the competition front as well. Um, you know, I, everybody's behaving as, you know, you got to prepare as though this is your last year of the administration with great hope that, you know, it is really only the last year of the second, the first term before the second term starts. And everybody wants to get as much out the door um, bef before the end of the year as possible. So, Nick, I was glad to hear you mention the Supreme Court because that's my next question. Um, we already know that the Supreme Court is going to hear two abortion-related cases before the end of this term uh, on regarding the abortion, one regarding the abortion pill mifepristone and one on state obligations under MTELA, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. Um, but there's another big health-related case that doesn't feel very health-related because it's about herring fishing. Um, but we all know, those of us who, who really get down in the weeds that if the Supreme Court overturns the, the Chevron deference precedent, it could have a big impact on health care, couldn't it? Absolutely. I mean, this case is critical to essentially every agency at HHS. Um, the key question is whether um, you know when Congress passes a law and the president signs it into law, um, and they are crystal clear about every single provision and how it ought to be implemented, how much of you know, the implementation can, can be deferred to the agency to figure out what makes sense. 
And, you know, the court case that, that the Chevron case that's been um, sort of, you know, precedent has been in existence since 1984. And you think about just how detailed um, all of the payment policies at CMS, implementing the No Surprises Act related to surprise billing, implementing the prescription drug pricing reforms from the IRA, provisions from the ACA on, you know, preventive services. All of these are very complex pieces of legislation and a lot of latitude was given to the agencies to implement them in, in sort of, you know, common sense ways in accordance with, with what, you know, the agencies think was Congress's intent. Um, the notion that this could be thrown out the door and the implications that's going to have not only for future court challenges of existing regulations already on the books, but also the amount of staff that would have to be hired by Senate and House Ledge Council. I mean, I loved the team I worked with at Senate Ledge Council. I mean, there aren't enough, there's not enough manpower over there to write with the level of detail that may be needed if Chevron is overturned. I mean, this is a could have a huge impact on the states too, right? And the way that the states deal with the the federal government and with stakeholders. We have actually been getting questions from state leaders about, you know, what they worry about is they're often implementing. Um, there are a lot of different requirements, and I think sometimes, and this is this is true at the state level as well. Those who legislate. Um, don't necessarily see all of the different implementation steps. And so the thought of like, you know, to Sarah's point, if there was litigation around existing regulations and programs that have already been implemented at the state level, and you would have to think about how to do those differently, would be a huge undertaking, not just at the federal level, but also at the state level, particularly on programs like Medicaid. So I think there's state-based marketplaces, all of those um, areas like the Touch the AC, for example, among many others. So I think there's just questions about how is the federal government really thinking about this? What are the courts going to do? And then how do states even start to think about to prepare for something like that? And you can just only watch and wait because states have to react to whatever is sort of in front of them. Um, and that's that's how it will roll out. But um, there are already questions that are coming to us about what is the potential impact and how do we even start thinking about this? Nick, yeah. want to add something to this? No, and, and I was talking to my colleague Laney about this earlier today. You know, it's you look at what happened when Alina was decided by the Supreme Court, and you saw this how how it slowed down regulatory behavior within the departments, and that's just talking about the you know the kind of obliteration of the sub-regulatory abilities that the agencies have. This is a hundred times that. So you know, like, and and Alina itself, I mean, slowed down to the point where if you look at even the statutorily required rules and the average day, amount of days they were late, you know, right afterwards. Um, I mean, I think there was even a year where we had two inpatient rules. Uh, like, it's, it's just, a, it's, it's a wild, it's, it's going to be the, a little bit of a wild west that, you know, I hope in the end, uh, well, we're not never going to tell the Supreme Court what to do, but it will definitely create a struggle for whoever wins the White House, because it won't just be, filling up your 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 uh, presidential appointee folks it will be bringing back some people from years ago that have the experience that understand how all of it was built up to where it is today to be able to unwind some of the things as Hemi mentioned especially on the state level because it's it's I, and it, I, it really just depends on how the the uh, the ruling is is written um, but you know if it's if it's retrospective, we, we're, we're in for a very interesting, very nerdy uh, conversation after that. Well, this is certainly a court that doesn't really worry about shaking things up. So we will obviously see by this summer what they decide to do. I'm gonna to turn to a couple of audience questions. Um, whoops, lost my screen. Here's one. Uh, can you expand about ways that states will address workforce that the workforce issues that cares for older adults? I think this is a, you know, we've got the baby boomers retiring. We've got basically no long term care policy in the United States um, and no one seems to be doing anything about it. I like to say I wrote my first long term care story in 1987 <laughs> and, you know, thinking, ah, like, you know, 2003 or 2004, this will all be worked out. And now we're at 2024 and it's not. Yes, um, I'm happy to, to take that first. Um, so I will just say, you know, 
silver lining perhaps, um, aging has become a top priority for state leaders. And I say that because when I was at the National Governors Association, I was like, let's do a project on aging. Very lukewarm response, I'll be very honest. Um, but coming out of the pandemic, I think the sort of bright light that was shown on nursing homes and kind of their failures to really be able to meet the moment um, and the amount of folks that want to be receiving care in their homes, they do not want to be in nursing homes. The polls are showing between 70 to 80% of people do not want to be in nursing homes, but we don't have um, the staff to really fully support people in their homes. So I, this states have really been focused on this. Um, there have been governor's task forces set up. There have been legislative actions. And just to get a little bit more specific, ARPA actually um, provided some funding where there's been a lot of innovation at the state level of thinking about how to invest in the direct care workforce, raising rates, doing bonuses, thinking about sort of longer term recruitment and retention plans, thinking about paying family caregivers. A number of states are doing that now, really trying to incorporate the family caregiver as another part of the puzzle. There's um, interest in nursing home reform, both on a quality and consumer experience, as well as a payment side. Um, and I would say just in the home and community-based services, thinking about how to really get rid of those wait lists and making investments and in how to get more people into those services. They're all by waiver, right? So it's a very fragmented system that we have here. And Medicaid, unfortunately, is the primary payer for many of those services because we don't have a private long-term care system, to your point, Julie. So I'll just say, because I'm an optimist person. Um, I do think there's a lot of interest at like very high levels at, at the state level at least of like how do we really do more about it. There's lots of states doing master plan on aging now across the country. Again, something that wasn't happening before. I'm thinking holistically about how we support the population, not just about the healthcare services, but housing and food insecurity. Those are all really cropping up as real challenges. So, so I just say, um, and one thing just to get more specific on the direct care workforce, there are some states that are really thinking about how to to, um, more uniformly provide credentialing for licensed and unlicensed um, direct care workers to really professionalize um, the, the job and bring people in from different areas who can serve different populations, both on the aging and disabled side. So, um, so good work going on there. Sarah and Nick, you know, I remember when aging was a really big issue on Capitol Hill. Um, both houses had aging committees and they were pretty active. Um, it seems to, to not be top of mind for a lot of federal lawmakers, which surprises me because older people vote. <laughs> I mean, I think on the Democratic side of the aisle, there's still a lot, a tremendous amount of interest in wanting to do something on long-term care. Um, I mean, certainly this was a key piece of the BBB, um, and I think many people sort of have post-traumatic stress disorder from the BBB, but um, Senator Casey was really a leader on a lot of those components um, related to home and community-based services and the, the workforce-related issues. And um, there's still a, a strong interest in, in moving forward, and of course, um, Mr. Pallone, when he was chairman, uh, introduced legislation to essentially create a, a Medicare Part E um, that would have advanced, um, you know, more long-term care services for senior populations. And I think the, the question around focus and why aren't they focusing on it now, I mean, I think so much of it has to do with finding a dance partner on the other side of the aisle uh, and how do we pay for it? Yeah, Nick, that's got to be sort of the, the biggest thing. I mean, these are all services that people need, and many of them don't have the money to afford it themselves, which is why they're at the government in the first place. Yeah, you know, it, you, you made a point uh, that, you know, it's interesting that there used to be a lot of action and a lot of work being done here. You know, it's it's interesting to look at the fact that most of the people that are in Congress are going to be looking at potentially long-term care. Um, and, you know, it's one of those that, you know, it's easy to throw stones until it's something that, that you see, whether it's you or, or your parents. Um, I mean, this, for me, this comes down to, are we going to get to a point where on a bipartisan basis, we understand the overutilization of the emergency department uh, in America? You know, where we don't have services, preventative services, when we don't have emergency services, where we don't have long-term care services, it just becomes the the it just becomes the ER that is where everyone goes because, you know, uh, Mtala, you know, basically <laughs> requires you to to be there, and, you know, I I I'll tell you in my time, 
uh, working on the Hill. I got calls from members all the time. His constituents are called, you know, uh, the hospital won't, you know, keep me long enough to let me go into a nursing home. The nursing home says that I'm fine, but I can't really stand. I got to get, you know, I, I, I have to, I have to go back home. I'm scared to go home. I live alone, you know, like, you know, go out and solve these, these constituent problems. Each and every one of those scared people calls 911. And each 911 call costs more than providing care in the home. And, you know, and, and again, I, I hate to harp on this, but, you know, until we're no longer hostage to, you know, kind of actuarial, the actuarial bodies that run our government, basically, they're the most powerful legislators we have on the state and federal level. If they tell you something costs money, you know, the chances of that going through have now dropped through the floor. Right. And that, and, you know, and, you know, our, one of our good friends uh, who was at CBO in the 2000s predicted that Part D was never going to work. Right. And there's no real like turnaround to the fact that that didn't actually happen. Or maybe the fact that we the last, uh, you know, budget analysis was a trillion dollars off. You know, all that time, there's activity that's not being done to advance legislation that can help people because of the fact that we live by this predict predictive analysis um and so you know that's that's just kind of where where my my head is on where we can and can't move forward but long-term care suffers from that problem is that if we were to provide standard services for uh, you know unhealthy adults particularly and we can start even with just multiple chronic conditions let's just shave off the, t the, the cream on this and say multiple chronic conditions we're going to provide more at-home health because of the fact that you are more likely to end up in the emergency room and cost three times as much for one day than you would have for weeks so until we get to that point none of these policies can move forward i mean even in the aca with the super majority you know they didn't they didn't authorize funding for the class act right which was something that everyone dreamed about for, and has dreamed about for a long time because you can't agree we can't because again the actuary said no that will cost you way too much money even though we don't think about kind of you know how the behavioral change of of, of enacting new policy is going to and we're going to be we're going to be stuck spinning our wheels in our healthcare system and i'm i'm jealous of having working with the states at least you know i i'm starting to see a lot more action there on the kind of new innovative programs you know where in the fed we're still a little bit stuck on well like if it doesn't save money that you know and it's like but will it help people will it keep people healthier will it help people live will it let you spend three four more months with your grandmother you know that doesn't matter right because it costs too much and then you start drawing partisan lines on what can and can't be spent. Well, I have a much shorter term question from the audience. Um, let me see if I can find it. Oh, thoughts on whether Congress will just end up doing CRs for the whole year and what's the likelihood of adding the PBM reform that we've been talking about to the next CR or a lame duck doc fix if we don't get to it before then? Three really meaty questions. Um, hmm, which one to start with first? Um, so on on sort of the PBM question, I, I think, you know, look, there's a lot of commonality and a lot of interest um, between some of the PBM provisions between the two chambers. And you could see, you know, potentially some of the issues around, you know, banning uh, spread pricing in Medicaid, for example. Transparency for PBMs is definitely, you know, one that all of the committees agree needs to happen. Um, but some of the the, the uh, additional proposals related to um, delinking, um, Medicare delinking came out of the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, commercial delinking has been discussed at the Senate Health Committee. I think there's more of an open question about whether the time is right for those, and there, there, you know, sort of bipartisan consensus can be found on some of those provisions. And then I think the other open question is whether, uh, to the extent that some of these PBM and pharmacy um, reforms are included, do the savings from that get plowed back into improving the Part D benefit? Um, for example, through, you know, some limited um, rebate pass-through for, for certain Part D drugs, 
uh, or are they used to offset other provisions in the bill? And that I think where where you know the 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 parties land on that will be important and plays into what happens on the physician payment fix. I I think there is still very strong bipartisan interest across all of the committees to provide some level of conversion factor relief um, for 2024. I suspect it's going to be done on a prospective basis um, because nobody wants to spend money unnecessarily for CMS to reprocess claims or force physicians to reprocess beneficiary cost sharing. Um, but how much room there is for relief really depends on how many offsets are available at the end of the day. I know in the past, CMS has pended claims if they thought that Congress was about to do something about the doc. Oh, during all of those pre-MACRA years when we had the SGR, um, are they not doing that now? I'm not sure whether any of our panelists know. Yeah, they are officially not for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's just it, just to add, it's, it's something that has been kind of much talked about since probably early fall of last year. And it seems as though these the better solution has just been to figure it out uh, and, and give that relief on a um, truncated schedule. So if it's 12 months of relief and we pass it in March, it's seven, you know, it's uh, I'm really good at math, nine months of, of relief uh that um that will be kind of the same amount of money but but just over that course of time exactly. you know, Smush and, 12 months of relief into nine months <laughs> yeah yeah and and so you know which then again you know just creates a higher cliff at the end as we played we played this game before um and you know so you know on the cr thing i think until we see less rhetoric, I don't know how we avoid CRs being the way that we pass things. Um, you know, back in the day, we used to blink and then all of a sudden a bipartisan deal would be passed and everyone would already be on their airplane by the time you go blue screen. Um, and I just don't know if that's the case anymore. And, and you know, to the comments on, on the PBM uh, work, I think the PBMs are very interesting entities because they're highly unregulated and it's because they were you know, employer benefit managers until Part D happened and no one really expected them to step in. You step into the void. And so to, to Sarah's point, you know, I look at a lot of these policies and there's always ways, you know, when we when the administration put out the rebate rule, which ended up being just the biggest pay for in the, in the history of America. Um, but, you know, we you saw behavioral change in unregulated entities and all of a sudden, you know, they're 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 shifting funds one way or the other. And and so I where some of this legislation actually takes us forward uh, it'd be interesting i look at things like delinking though and I, i'd challenge you know our attendees to take a look at companies like uh capital rx uh, it's a pbm that's a technology pbm that's already delinked right they don't do they don't do the make money off of drug prices side and you look at the savings they're able to garner per patient uh, on the cost of drugs and so you look at that you see it already happening and so to that point um, hopefully people are looking at kind of real life, real evidence to say what's going to be done. And, and, you know, regrettably, I think the word transparency is now used just as much as synergy was used in the early 2000s, you know, where, what, what, where's the end game uh, on, on transparency, if we're going to be successful, you know, where, you know, major insurers currently already have all those apps where you can look at the costs of everything you do and they have less than one percent utilization by the patient population maybe because they don't know but maybe because it's complicated but at the same time just because something's available to be seen doesn't mean people are looking at it and so that's that's where kind of to that question you know unfortunately that we i do see some of that stuff passing through um whether we get it done on a on a cr is going to be tough all right, well, we are running out of time, but I want to go go around quickly um, to ask each of you what is, if there's one thing, if you have to narrow it down to one thing that you think will be most important uh, in health policy this year, what will it be? Sarah, why don't you start? Oh, the most important thing in health policy. Um, for this year. For this year, okay. Um, I mean, I, I think I'm going to double down that the workforce and behavioral health issues are the most critically important things that I think we need to make progress on this year and that um, if we don't make progress on are going to hamper our ability to uh, work on a lot of other issues in the future. Amy? 
Well, Sarah stole my two topics. Um, so behavioral health and workforce is clearly a top list. I will just also say one other thing we haven't talked much about is affordability. Um, and really thinking about affordability, politically, um, elected leaders at the state level have been asking, like, healthcare costs too much, do something, please do something. So I do think at the state level, prescription drug costs, thinking about health system consolidation and what we do about that is going to be a topic of, of much debate as well. Nick? Yeah, no, I think those are those are 100% top of the line of where it is. You know, the unfortunate part about massive legislation for, for victims and for vulnerable populations only happens, and I don't mean to be crude about this, but when the wrong person dies, right? And, you know, you look at the fact that, you know, 20 years ago, breast cancer and, and awareness was nowhere where it is, and now the NFL sponsored it, sponsors it for a month, right? We have to get to that place on mental behavioral health because it is it is by far going to be someone something that much like Alzheimer's is going to touch every single human being uh, in in the United States uh, over the course of the next I mean 12 months you'll you'll see it somewhere in, in your life and it's it's only going to get important uh, if if we all make it important. Well, thank you all. I'm going to turn it back over to Allison. Great. Thank you so much, Julie, Hamie, Nick, and Sarah for joining us today. And thanks to all of you who stayed a few minutes after for this conversation. We're so grateful that you took the time um, to participate in this rich discussion. And we hope you found it uh, very informative and will take what you learned and apply it in your work. Before we go, we want to hear from you. We appreciate you taking a few minutes to complete this a brief evaluation survey, which you'll also receive via email later today. As a reminder, the recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel, the Alliance website, and you will receive a copy of that in uh, an email shortly. Here at the Alliance, we host educational webinars and in-person events throughout the year, so please visit our website to sign up for our email list to receive the latest updates. Um, and, and you can join this event, our upcoming events like our really exciting briefing next week on February 1st, Perspectives for Media on Value-Based Care. Um, and, and thank you so much again for taking the time to, to be here with us. We hope to see you at a future event.